it's Saturday night and we've been waiting to talk about this mm. special episode because first of all, I'm in Chicago and you're from Chicago and who's the greatest director from Chicago that talked about exclusively Chicago. Without a doubt that that'd be John Hughes, uh, an icon, not only for our generation uh, with films, but also people like myself that grew up in, in the Chicago and Chicagoland area. Uh, he was legend. Like he was, uh, yeah, he was oh, like yeah. one of us. He was part of the family. Yeah. I swear it, it, it is when, uh, first of all, just to tell everyone, thanks for joining us. We're talking about John Hughes tonight. This is our first ever director tribute. As we all know that Steph Nation is dedicated to honoring not just the films, but the directors. And this is our first one. It's the most appropriate one we can talk about. It's John Hughes. When I was doing the research on this, it's insane how prolific this this guy is. I think, John, you had mentioned some, some facts here before we actually hit record. And it's just unbelievable. How many films and how many credits, you know, just beyond yeah. just directing? Yeah, you know, part of it's a very sad story because he's, he was only 59 years old when he passed away. So he's a very young guy. Uh, and he had 53 credits to his professional uh, resume. So you just think about how much more he could have done. Yeah. And, you know, um, it is. It's, it's, it's amazing how much work he actually did. Uh, and I know we'll talk more about it, but how influential he was to a generation of kids growing up watching his movies. He was, you know, he 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 affected a lot of us through the films that he made and the topics yeah. that were discussed in those movies. Hundred percent. It's it's truly a, a director. Now we we have obviously Stanley Kubrick, we have Steven Spielberg, uh, Smart Scorsese, yeah. and they've made incredible films. But for our generation, Generation X. This is, he is our, I'd say to my mom's generation, this is our Bob Dylan. This is our Beatles. This is, is, this is one of us. And there's a quote that I just wanted to start off with about John Hughes Mm. that he said, one of the most important things that he did in creating all these famous, you know, coming of age teen movies was that he respected the teenager. And yeah. I thought that was a really, really powerful quote uh, where most people, I won't say they don't respect the the youth per se, but he gave them their due. And you can see yeah. that with the characters uh, and just master storytelling, um, obviously from the Brat Pack, from Breakfast Club to Ferris Bueller's to 16 Candles, the, the list goes on and on. Um, yeah. and, and I will say, though, it is a very specific time and place. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say it was the nineties, you know, maybe bordering on early nineties, but to me, he is the, the eighties icon. John, would you agree? I, I think you said it really well. That's a great way to put it. He was kind of like our Bob Dylan. He was the guy, he was from Lansing, Michigan. So he was a Midwesterner. Yeah. You know, he's from the Midwest. Um, and I think he, he said it really well. He really respected teenagers. He made films about them, uh, and he was able to empathize with yeah. a lot of the characters in a way that was unique. They weren't like, yeah. you know, every film wasn't like Porky's, you know, these <laughs> films were funny. I mean, his films were funny, but they, they just resonated. They had, yeah. there was something sticky about them. And he was, he was definitely an icon. He was someone when he did die, like I felt like, you know, when certain celebrities die, you're kind of like, oh, it's sad. When yeah. John Hughes passed away, that was really sad. Because it felt like a, it felt like a, a part of my growing up. Yeah, you know, ha, ha, had it's like when a, your favorite musician dies way too early, and it's like you know when when John Hughes died, it was really sad. I, and I think growing up, I mean, he was our you can say soundtrack. He was our film track. He was he. Yeah. These are the films that defined a lot of how we interpreted our own experiences, yeah. how we interpreted the, the different clicks that goes on, the different personalities God. of, yeah. uh, in, a, in a typical high school and junior high, right? All the clicks, yeah. the dances, the cool clicks, the jocks, yeah. the nerds, everything. It, it literally I, was an education. If I were to, if, if, if I, I don't have kids, right? If I had a kid, who, <laughs> if neither. I had a kid who was, right? And if I had a kid who was, let's say 15, <clears throat> And he said, Dad, what was it like growing up? I say, I 
I said, there, there's, a, there's like four movies you have to see and you'll yeah. understand me. You see Ferris Bueller's day off yeah. weird science breakfast club and maybe uncle buck. Okay. Yeah. You watch those four films by John Hughes and you will understand my generation, our music, our, our fashion, mm -hmm. what we dealt with in terms of like just personal and social issues. Like, You'll see it like that. I would tell my kid, watch those movies and you'll understand my generation. Yeah, you'll you'll get it. And I think his films do that. Like you can literally you, like if you want to understand the 60s, watch Woodstock documentary and you'll see yeah. all about Woodstock. <laughs> but if you want to see what what it was like Gen X wise growing up in the 80s, John Hughes. And I think additionally, you had mentioned, you know, he had was born in Lansing, but he quickly moved yeah. to Northbrook, which yeah. is. In the North Shores, for those of you who are not from Chicago, yeah. this is kind of more an <laughs> affluent area, uh, about you know, 15, 20 minutes north of downtown. And this is where he was vigilant about shooting in Chicago. For example, they wanted, uh, I think the studios in LA wanted to shoot Breakfast Club in, uh, I think it was Paramount wanted to shoot it in uh, some suburb of LA, right? Which is where right. most of the movies are shot because of cost sure. structure. And he was so offended by it that he switched studios, which to yeah. me is like, I love hearing stories like that. Yeah. It's so dedicated. And I'll tell you what, like growing up, there was movies where you saw they're clearly Manhattan, New York, which from 99% of the people that we don't live in Manhattan, even people yeah. in New York city don't live in Manhattan. Right. It's one of the five boroughs, very right. elite, but so many movies were, were shot there or you had them by the beach, right. Where I grew up, right. But everyone's surfing and skateboarding and, and they're having fires and bonfires on the beach. Well, here you go, have these movies. And to be honest with you, John, coming, coming from the West coast, I didn't know where they were at. Obviously Ferris Bueller's uh, day off was, was Chicago, but they, yeah. they were very, um, how do I say it? They, they were almost uh, not ambiguous. Yeah, but they, they're kind of generic. I mean, they were sort yeah, of like almost you know, generic. They really didn't have a ton of personality. You kind of fit it. It was like perfect middle America, right? Yeah. It was middle America. Yeah, you know, it wasn't like country. It wasn't beach. It wasn't urban. It was like middle suburbia. Yeah. It was suburbia. That's where we grew up. Now, mind you, some of the areas where they filmed this. Like Weird Science was filmed, a lot of it was filmed in Highland Park, which is a very, you know, much more affluent neighborhood, yeah. uh, it, it, a city or town in Chicago. But they still were kind of very middle America. And so uh, I, I think people could relate to that a little bit. I, I would say this just to clarify, it was definitely white. And I would say it was oh, yeah, middle, yeah, it was yeah, middle yeah. to not upper. It was definitely not yeah. luxury. You know, it wasn't a Beverly Hills, but I mean, yeah. home, alone, home alone, which, you know, he had a huge part in, I didn't actually yeah. direct it, but, but, but produced it. Right. Uh, these were at Winnetka, which is our very, this is where a lot of bankers live. It's kind of your executives. <laughs> it's not like yeah. Prince of Bel Air, but it's definitely close. And I think you saw it with a lot of, those yeah. so, um, and, but, yeah. but, it, it, but in terms, it, it, it was, I'd say, Everyone could relate because the schools were a lot of them were public schools. They were, yep. you know, it, it wasn't so. It was relatable, even for it was. Like, um, But what do you think made him so great, John? Like, yeah. what what if you had to tell if you had your, your imaginary kids now? You said, "Well, hey, Dad, yeah. why was this guy so good? Well, what what made him special?" I think. The comment that you made earlier and the quote about respecting teenagers, I think you you saw that in the movies. The movies that he made, The Breakfast Club's a great example there. Uh, it was fun, right? Like there was, a, it had it had comedy, it had drama, it had some sadness to it, some really uh, difficult topics. He, he, the films he, he directed and some of them he wrote, mm -hmm. uh, they were, you know, they just felt authentic, you know, like, mind you, yeah. some of it like weird science, right? No one's going to create a woman out of a computer, but maybe, maybe, maybe like, you know, maybe, you know, Zuckerberg will someday, yeah. but like, oh, yeah. but that's I mean, been, that's been though, done already. <laughs> right. Even though some of it was a bit funky, but the characters were relatable. They were yeah. authentic and they were genuine. And I, I, I just, I think that's what made his movies so unique is because you knew that when you went to see his films, there was something really genuine about them. 
you know yeah. and he did a great job not only like this with genuine meaning like the characters themselves but just mm-hmm. the way they 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 were a mirror to what exactly. was going on in the culture of yeah. these teenage lives like i dressed the way they dressed i lived yeah. where they made the movie mm-hmm. it was completely relatable as a matter of fact a lot of kids from my school were like were extras you know in yeah. uncle buck and so it, it, it i i watched these movies and it was a mirror of of kind of my my life in in high school maybe i didn't you know live in the giant house like that or drive a super fancy <laughs> car but but i mean the social problems that kids were having the peer pressure yeah. all that kind of shit that was real and i think that his movies were special that way yeah um they were just like the soundtracks of our lives well, he wasn't, it wasn't goofy. You know, there were a lot of yeah. like after school specials that were trying to target the teen oh, yeah. market. And right. there were a lot of hyperboles and yeah. it was scenarios that I won't say would never happen, but it was the characters were hyperboles. And I think in this case, you're like weird science. Obviously it's a <laughs> fictional story now, probably not so much. Probably not so much. I tried it. <laughs> um, but- <laughs> Didn't work. It um yeah I didn't you have to wear I had the bra the, on your I, head I, I, yeah you I, I had the, the bra on your head computer. I, I didn't have the apple so I I had a you know a cheap compact it, it didn't work you know, <laughs> one arm came out but it was um I I think the characters as you said were a mirror everyone knew yeah this Molly Ringwald character I thought yeah. Breakfast Club exact you knew the nerd you knew the kind of basket yeah. case the rebel yeah. and they they behaved the way they behave as in a, in a reality. Like it was, it was a, a true representation. Yeah. And, and I think that's I think, what everyone could just go. I know that person. I know that person. And I think John, like his past. So John, Hughes passed. And I think you'll find this interesting because you and I were in this business, but he started off in advertising, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. he's writing jokes. Then he went in Leo Burnett, right? Remember yep. that? Yeah. My, 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 my old company. That's right. Leo Burnett. Yeah. I think it was in New York and he's doing. Yeah copy he's doing ads and he had deadlines and as you know it's all about capturing the insight right it's the typical how do i sell these mops back in the day to housewives procter and gamble and like oh i want to really know who they are so it's almost this like not ethnography where you study them and i yeah. think that skill set carried over to how he studied uh teenagers and I thought yeah. a similar a similar one was like what Cameron Crowe did with with Fast Times at Richmond High, which I thought, you know, I think yeah. John Hughes would have respect. That was almost a precursor yeah. to yeah. his movies, how he respected like, oh, my gosh, th- these are real characters. Yeah. And I think one that's a great Scott. I, I totally agree with what you're saying, too. There's a, a trivia about uh, Breakfast Club for those listening or watching who haven't seen it, you know please go and see it. There's a scene where all the characters are sitting down in the library together. <clears throat> they had smoked a joint and they're talking about uh, like their vulnerabilities in their lives, talking about like Molly Ringwald, the pressures of being like a perfect girl. And then the mm-hmm. pressures of being an athlete and getting a scholarship and the nerdy kid <clears throat> who, you know, wanted to kill himself. And that whole scene was improvised. There was no script yeah. for that. He allowed these characters who were, you know, more or less like older teenagers at the time, the Brat Pack, to just basically live out their these yeah. characters through the way they were feeling. And I think that was such genius because, he, oh, yeah. he, like you said, he did ethnography, whether he just did it or not, like he's lived with these kids, but he respected them enough to say they're not just stupid kids. Like these kids that he found, these characters, these actors were really good, mind you. And they yeah. were able to, you know, they were able to just bring it to life in such a way that um, and allow them the ability to do some improv- improvisation and to add yep. some dialogue. I don't know if it's like method acting, if you want to call it, but it's a way to be authentic as possible. And it came yeah. through in his films. I, I think so. And I think it's everyone could easily relate and say, I, as I mentioned, like, yeah, I know that guy, different name, whatever, but they, they all act the same. And I think, it it helped it was kind of this symbiotic relationship where he got the insights from us who were living those you know that lifestyle or the, in those times and yeah. he also brought it back to us so it could help us almost define what we were seeing like yep. if you can imagine the breakfast club people could start to go, oh that's like a molly ringwald or that guy's like a judd nelson people could yeah. then go back and 
and take what they had learned and put labels back on uh, the people that he was writing about. And I thought that was, I remember very distinctly uh, watching 16 Candles and I was a bit young. Um, I wasn't in, in high school at the time, uh, but just that how people would talk about it and they would refer to the scenes uh, like in the dancing or long duck dong or oh, the parties. So oh, it's going to be, for example, I mean, it's going to be like the party in 16 candles. People would use that as references. And yeah. I think that's just a powerful example of his influence. Yeah. No, even like, uh, I remember girls in my high school say, Oh, he's not quite a Jake Ryan, but he's yeah. pretty good. Jake I mean, Jake Ryan. Ryan, Jake Ryan, you know, at the end of the movie, he's like this good looking dude. He's got like the, the whole look on. He drives a, he drives a Porsche. Of course, he's a senior in high school, drives a Porsche, doesn't everybody? And he like pulls out in front of her driveway and he waits for, her. I mean, girls just melted, like literally yeah. melted. And so I think that he did, like he became part of the vernacular, right? He became like, you know, like, oh, he's a, not quite a Jake Ryan. And those kinds of that, that really does yeah. kind of go back to, you know, I mean, growing up in those days and the impact that those characters and his movies had on, on all of us. Well, I mean, it had a huge impact on our entire video cast here, Steph Nation. Yeah. Which yeah. He yeah. Created Cl clearly. Steph McKay, right? This is James Spader. Uh, yeah. Pretty in Pink. Um, and his muse, which uh, is really interesting to read about, was Molly Ringwald. So the saw her yeah. headshot and just was immediately yeah. enamored. And it was actually Molly Ringwald that recommended the title track, Pretty in Pink, from Psychedelic Furs. Uh, and I just thought one part we haven't talked about is his, I mean, this guy would be an amazing DJ because the song, Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, the, the oh, soundtrack. So good. And he, and he had, he, he, it was a perfect mix between of American music and British, right? He was almost an Anglophile yeah. uh, using like echo and the bunny men, psychedelic furs, obviously. Um, and it, 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 it holds up to date. Like those soundtracks, are still very relevant. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when the when those movies came out, like when 16 Candles came out, or yeah, uh and, and, you know, you like you just hope there was a soundtrack released with it. Yeah. Because there were there were such great films. And you're so right, Scott. Like I said it earlier, he just had this ability to make movies that had just great music that we loved that we yeah. were like it was modern music that we were into. And he and, and like even like the characters, like just the way they dressed, the way they yeah. looked. I mean, Steph, of course, of course, Steph, the linen suits, the hair, you know, yeah, the, 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 yeah, we were trying to get to that level. You know, we were trying to get there. But like, you know, all those characters, like 16 Candles, right? Each character yeah. that they had, the athlete, the, you know, the, uh, the you know, the the perfect girl and the socialite. Yeah. And then we had the, the bat. They all, we all knew people that dressed like that, looked like that. And his talent, the, the thing about John Hughes, which I find, I won't say underrated because he's definitely appreciated, mm. uh, but I would say he's appreciated in a very finite segment, which is the 80s, right? They, they yeah. I won't say they pigeonholed him, but it's like, oh, that's a John Hughes, that, that time frame, almost like a band that is like, they were only in grunge yeah. and they never did anything after. But he also produced Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Obviously, yep. Home Alone. Yep. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles is has no teens in it, right? This is nothing about no, teen angst. No, and it's no. just his humor. Yeah. If you think about even Ferris Bueller's using uh, Twist and Shout, yeah. which he said when they were yeah. writing the screen, and he was fast. He's so, so prolific. He wrote, I think, Breakfast Club in like three days, the screenplay. Yeah. And they're listening to the White Album. And so he's, you know, and, and so he had all these influences and he would take a notebook out and just write. And I thought- Unbelievable. Just this, that's when you hit that genius where you're like, yeah, yeah, that could take me five years to write and it still suck. It, yeah. it wouldn't even make after, <laughs> after afternoon school special. Well, you know what? You brought up a good point. Like, you know, uh, he was a a copywriter at, at yeah. Leo Burnett, what, one of my good friends and one of the funniest people that I know, uh, this a gentleman named Dave Lenny, uh, was a, a VP creative at Leo Burnett and a, 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 a copywriter, started out as a copywriter. Yeah. And and was a guy who made some of the funniest commercials I've ever seen, yeah. And just a hilarious guy. And so, like, yeah. you think about John Hughes being in the same kind of role. Some of the funniest people I knew were copywriters in advertising. They had yeah. just a wit about them that was like, yeah. "Damn, that's 
funny. How come yeah. I didn't think of that? And I could totally see how John Hughes kind of fell into that category, how yeah. he had that gift. And I think you saw it with Planes and Trains and Almost Wheels. The first scene is him presenting advertising yeah. campaigns. Yeah. Or yeah, Home in Alone. New York, and then you know he he yeah. uh, didn't direct uh, uh, Vacation, but he had a yeah. major contribution yeah. and wrote a lot yeah. of the jokes, uh, which we just yeah. all love today. So I, I I think you know obviously he's known for his teen movies, but people don't realize the guy had was part of so many successful franchises. But I will say, in the nineties, the magic wore off. Uh, as mm. you can see with some of the movies that he launched, they didn't have the same effect. Uh, even like Beethoven, you know, was talking about dogs. There was a, yeah. I, and, and hey, listen, no one's, I mean, everyone has bombs. All right. I wish I was in a position to have a bomb. I, if you have nothing, <laughs> I, I, I want a bomb. That means I had something good. <laughs> or they, but oh, come, on. Uh, come on, man. But I think, uh, but you're to, right. Yeah. Maybe and it was just his, you know, the Beatles were amazing in the 60s, 70s, not so much, even though they broke up. Uh, people have a certain creativity, Bob Dylan himself. Um, but I, I I thought as we look at his kind of heyday in those 80s, yeah, no one did it better. Now, going into our no. John, our personal, what scenes do you remember in in, in your age? Because oh my God. you're special in the sense you grew up where they filmed. Uh, and I know where you grew up and they filmed a lot of that. I mean, Northbrook was did. like the epicenter of John. Yeah. Land. yeah. Northbrook Highland park. Um, I, I would say Scott, you know, that there's, there's way too many scenes to go into of his movies. That I love, I mean, there's yeah. so many scenes that are just, Oh my God. I mean, Ferris Bueller, alone character. Captures, but, but, yeah, but I'll say, I, I think, I think what's memorable about John Hughes movies is, is, is the places the locations he filmed mm. that I knew so well, right? Yeah. And before we started taping, I was telling you about a scene in, in Weird Science where they, uh, you know, they're the two guys are sitting down below, uh, like in the mall, and all of a sudden these the two jerks, Rob, Robert Downey Jr., who's one of them, they dump like ices uh -huh. over their heads. They were in front of the food court, and there was this candle store called Wicks and Sticks. And I remember seeing the movie and going, Dude, I was just there yesterday. <laughs> like I was literally at that yeah. pizza place next to it. And so, and then the, the part in Weird Science where like they're chasing, they're getting chased by the police and they're going down the, the main street in Highland Park. I think the movies that I, re, the things that I, I love about those movies is just locations because they were so, yeah. even Ferris Bueller's Day Off, the scenes yeah. in Chicago. I think those are things that have always stuck with me because um, they were where I grew up. They were close yeah. to home. Uh, and uh, and a lot of people don't have that in their lives, like to say, "Oh yeah, I live like a block away from where they shot this movie. I used to yeah. hang out right there at the mall." Um, I think those are the things that are unique about John Hughes. I think about so many great scenes, you know. I mean, yeah. weird science. I love weird science when they're drunk and they're in the bar and they're smoking yeah. a cigarette, you know, and they're with the old blues guy in the bar. There's so <laughs> many hilarious, I mean, there's so many hilarious scenes. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, there's so many. How about you? Is there any that well, you can isolate? I think for me, you know, living in the Southern California area, you're connected to a lot of films just because of this it's general, like they film around there. But with John Hughes, you know, and never having been to Chicago or, yeah. or the suburbs, I still felt connected. I still felt that uh, I knew these characters. And I think Farmer Ted. Farmer Ted. <laughs> on 16 Candles, who was Anthony yeah. Michael Hall. And I was, I won't say, I, I was i was more like Wheeze, his sidekick. A total uh, dork, total yeah. nerd. Uh, but I like how he gave them almost that they were cool. And yeah. that at the very end, he's, you know, Farmer Ted's hooking up with the hot girl, Jake Ryan's girlfriend. Right, and right. I thought that was scenes, I, that was a, definitely a twist because it was it was not the traditional, you have the quarterback with the cheerleader yeah. and the nerd yeah. is there supporting him. And I think those are very standard and they were very safe for Hollywood. I thought John yeah. Hughes, it, looking back, was very rebellious. And I loved how he was so authentic to his vision. Even on yeah. location, he said, I have to do it here. 
And I, I just love that in anything in business and, and artists. Uh, so those scenes, I mean, yeah, I, I think 16 Candles was probably my favorite. I think, I think, <laughs> I think my, my, my favorite John Hughes characters, and I think about all the movies that he had, right? Yeah. Because uh, you, you, I started, as you were talking about, I started, I started mm-hmm. thinking about it. And if I look back on all the characters, the one character, believe it or not, besides Steph, obviously, yeah. You know, obviously we looked up to Steph. We're going to have a character- whole, by the way, we're going to have a whole uh, just podcast about Steph. So we and, are. And it is our goal to get James Spader to come here <laughs> and to tell us. Like, if he's ever in Vegas, I'll yeah, catch him. Yeah. Like James, like, please don't, you know, we, we're using your character's name. I don't know if we can be sued. But <laughs> you hear us? We have no money. Feel free to reach <laughs> out. Yeah. We have no money. Uh, we'll get nothing. This is, so besides Steph is a character. The one character that I just thought was so cool, like just the way yeah. he dressed, was um, John Bender, uh, which was Judd Nelson oh, yeah. from Breakfast Club. Yeah. I just thought, man, like that guy, the way he dressed, like, like he was grunge way before grunge, oh, yeah. like way. And he just had this look and attitude. I'm like, I've never seen that movie and just like thought, I had a bit of a man crush on Judd Nelson in that movie. Like, <laughs> that dude is fucking cool. Look at his clothes. Yeah. I could never be as cool as that. And not that I like loved his character per se. I yeah. loved the persona and the way he looked. I looked at that and went, damn, that dude's cool. Mm. Yeah. I like I, to be like that guy. I, to those characters, the whole brat pack was yeah. just it was such a um such a special group it's almost like a a favorite team or sports team that you follow through and i think now as you look at other people like our generation right Mm. our people our gen these are we're talking to our people and hopefully i mean we know a lot of our listeners are our people these are just so when we talk about long duck dong you know what we're talking about (laughs) yeah and it's like and no one's going to get canceled from that because i I mean we're not pronouncing it right but they mean a lot to us they're almost like these friends if you will uh that have helped us go and and go from junior high into high school and beyond they're they're all it's it's almost like those soundtracks of bands that you feel like oh i know you you've been a huge part of my life who would you like to meet john out of that Brad pack and what would you say to them oh man you know um it's a good question if i could meet anyone from that Brad pack you know it would be interesting um because he was in so many of them you know anthony michael hall mm-hmm. would be an interesting person to meet because i could just go tell me about breakfast club tell me about weird signs uh tell me about 16 candles yeah uh you know those are like epic movies, right? Yeah. He's a guy I love to meet, and it's like, just can can you just like I'll buy you like a, like a, a several drinks and yeah. just like give me some great stories about these films because to your point, they meant a lot to me, it meant a yeah. lot to a lot of us, a lot, like of a lot. And yeah. you know, we were not only fans, but these are really personal movies that mean a lot to 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 us as we grew up so yeah. i would i i would i would love to meet him i would like to meet rob Lowe and just slap him for making that hockey movie what was it called young blood uh but who would you like to meet scott of all the people I, in the brat pack who'd be the person i think too i i would like to meet molly ringwald who mm. uh in in just ask her i didn't have any sisters growing up and I was, and she lived in it, france too yeah and it was yeah. a male dominated kind of house and just saying oh. like how wh- mm. How, what fans have what is the relationship with you and your fans because i can imagine with her character she plays an i like she's an icon of the 80s mm. it's an icon of a lot of the uh, our generation yeah. that'd be one obviously steph w- would be one but we're going to oh, talk about yeah. him later but he's I, in a different category he's in a different like, category as, he, as he's a on human a being that i want to meet beyond the brad pack yeah i think steph. john john kuzak you know, being here another from, from Chicago, I would want to just ask him how he viewed that because he went beyond John Hughes. He he was really yeah. broke out of that. He's obviously a hugely wildly successful actor. Uh, and he's a single dude too, like me. And so I'd want to add, I just want to like talk with him about that yeah. role and how that set him up and how he looks back 
on our generation because yeah. we are all getting older and it's yeah. i would like to see their reaction to yeah there was a, a I, thought some, was. I, I was actually you just made me like jog a memory that i had forgotten about it's probably like four years ago in like yeah. some corporate nonsense meeting you know bs and they say oh who would you like to meet if you could yeah. go back in time meet anybody dinner. i remember i yeah right uh i remember like on the top of my list, uh, and this was after he, after he had passed away, was yeah. John Hughes. Yeah, I remember writing his name and going, "I would have loved to have met John yeah. Hughes, because he's a guy I, I would just a thank him, like yeah. thank you yeah. for doing what you did yeah. because it changed everything. Yeah, it made a generation. You defined. All, I would just praise him yeah. and make him feel uncomfortable for about ten minutes, <laughs> and then I would, and then I would just want to know, like. Talk to me about how these came to like, tell me about like stories yeah. or why these movies are important to you and what do you think about yeah. them? And just to get inside his head, I, totally. I would just, I, I would pay, I, I I don't know why I pay anything I could to, to, to meet him. I would ask him which one he liked the most. Besides, the I know most. Molly Ringwald was his muse, so to it's, speak. But, yeah. But which yeah. character did he actually fall in love with? And, and, and which character, it was there a character that sort of he yeah. wrote based on a lot of his personal. Yeah. Yeah, which, you know, background was there a character like, oh, I was just like this guy in high school. <laughs> you know, maybe there wasn't, but I love, or maybe it was a blend of them. Totally, but I love that. It's a great question. So, in our our last question here be before we uh, we part, what song? Oh, uh, I mean, I, I, what I, song? I, you have one song that I, reminds I, you of John Hughes. What is it? You know, uh, don't you forget about me. Okay. Uh, who 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 is that, Scott? You're the music guy. Simple minds. Don't simple fucking minds. I mean, that's the, it's it's the end, right? It's the end of Breakfast Club, yeah. you know. With with you know you know the whole. Uh, I remember seeing a guy once who had that silhouette tattooed on his arm, mm -hmm. you know, with John Bender coming out between the goalposts yeah. and the football field. I think when I think about that Simple Minds song, that's like just John Hughes to me. Yeah, I it, I remember going to see madonna like a virgin <laughs> tour because because the beast because yeah. the beastie boys warmed up yeah. and they played that song before she came on and the entire uic yeah. pavilion in chicago sang it out loud yeah. the whole oh, it's, thing it's an anthem it, how, it, how about it, you i there's there's two one is psychedelic first pretty in pink uh, oh, yeah. i i find this band insanely underrated they yeah, I agree. Actually, I agree. Incredible. I mean, you like if you like anything like David Bowie, you're gonna love Psychedelic first. Yeah. Uh the Agreed. title track to Pretty in Pink, which again Molly Ringwald uh found. Yep. And there was two versions. There was one before in like 1980, and then mm. they made it a little more happy for the film. So I definitely yeah. recommend the darker huh. version. It's good, good trivia. And uh the other is uh, "Bring on the Dancing Horses" by. Oh, Michael that's Bunnyman. a good one. Same too. movie. Oh, it's um, a good one too. And I got okay. There's one that I want to mention because I want to uh, end the dance scene in Sixteen Candles" as the Michael, oh, yeah. Anthony Michael. They play the specials "Little Bitch." The, right? the song's Little called bitch. "Little Bitch," yep. and it's yep. a ska band from the late yep. '70s. And yep. when I I knew, I had heard that song, and it was 20 years later when I made the connection and I was so happy that I went back. <laughs> Anyways. Well, Hey, listen, That's awesome. Everyone. Thank you so much. Again, we really appreciate your feedback. Uh, we're growing our subscriber base. We're on YouTube. Everyone. We have playlists. We have our, our beautiful faces there on video uh, as well as Spotify and the rest of the platform. Yeah. So everyone, if you like it, please share with your friends. That's how we please. grow. And we really appreciate it. And John, what, what what are you gonna what are you gonna listen to tonight? What's what's gonna be the John Hughes song? Well, now now I'm thinking about it. now I'm, I I have I have all his movies <laughs> on DV. I mean on DVD because I'm old and I have DVDs. So I think uh, you know we're gonna watch a little Sven Gulli tonight, of course, because nice. here in uh, uh, Vegas it's, it's yeah. on in about 15 minutes. But I think uh, after that, I think I'm gonna pop in 16 Candles oh, yeah. because. I just I just want to see the movie again, and my wife can drool over Drake Ryan, which is which is okay. I, I'm cool with that, and I, I would just like to see that movie again. So awesome. I think we might pop that in uh, awesome. tonight and see it again. Everyone, have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Take care.